Okay, so we've looked at the concept of linearity, and we've looked at the concept of time invariance, and now it's time to finish off our trilogy and look at the third system property I promised, which is causality. So there is a fourth property that's quite important called stability. In general, there are a lot of different definitions of stability that relate to one another in different ways. We're going to mostly in this class look at the question of what's called BIBO, bounded input, bounded output stability, particularly in the concept of linear time invariant systems. But we'll save that for later in the course when we've developed some more technical machinery. Just like with linearity and time invariance, Causality is conceptually orthogonal to linearity and time invariance. Systems can be linear or not, or they can be in time invariant or not, or they can be causal or not. So suppose we have a system, and maybe it is making the big smile that a linear system has, or maybe it's just having the little smile that all systems have. Maybe it's wearing the top hat of time invariance, or maybe it's not wearing the top hat of time invariance. Either way, Let's call the input x of t and the output y of t as we usually have. So we'll say a system is causal if the output y of t does not depend on the input x of t, or let me say x of tau, for tau bigger than t. Basically, to figure out what the output is at y of t, you don't need to look into the future. It doesn't depend on future inputs. It doesn't have to depend on past inputs, and it also doesn't have to depend on the current input. For instance, the system yt equals zero, this nihilistic system, it's linear, it's time invariant, and it's also causal. It does not depend on future inputs. It also incidentally doesn't depend on current inputs, and it also doesn't depend on past inputs because it doesn't depend on any inputs at all. Basically, a causal system is one that you can actually implement as a real-time device. Now, it's perfectly okay to talk about causal systems if you're thinking about post-processing data. So if you've already recorded a bunch of data on a hard drive and you are processing it after the fact, sure, you can run an algorithm that implements a non-causal data processing system on that. So compared to linearity and time invariance, it's usually fairly obvious whether the system is causal or not. So if we have y of t is equal to x of t minus 3, okay, that's fine. That's perfectly causal. But if I have y of t equal x of t minus 3 plus x of t plus 2, well, this guy is going to look into the future, so this guy is not causal. It doesn't matter that this part here looks into the past. This part's looking in the future, so the whole thing's not causal. And remember, the statement of causality needs to work for all these time values. So it doesn't make sense to say, oh, the system is causal for this part of time, but it's not causal for this other time range. And it also doesn't make sense to say that it's causal for certain inputs and not causal for other inputs. From a theoretical standpoint, these system definitions have to work for all input-output pairs. Now, something that students will often get confused by is what happens if I have time elements outside of the x. So suppose I do this. I have x of t. This is by itself would be perfectly causal. It doesn't look in the future. It only looks at the present. Again, it doesn't have to look at the present. These two signals don't look at the present. If I were to multiply this, say, by t minus 3, what does this do to causality? Absolutely nothing. The fact that there's a t in front of here is irrelevant. So the system will be linear. It will not be time invariant, right? It's not ti. It does not get to wear the top out of time invariance because there's a t sitting outside here. But this doesn't affect the causality at all. Causality is only a question about what's happening with t inside the x's here, inside the time references to the input. So students will sometimes think, oh, well, if I have a t plus 2 out here, this will mess up my causality. No, this is fine. This is perfectly causal, just as the system up here is perfectly causal. The t's that are sitting outside the argument 
of the X, as far as causality goes, these are fine. Again, this will mess up your time invariance, but it is fine from the standpoint of causality. Doesn't affect anything about the causality at all. So signals and systems instructors can come up with all sorts of weird systems where it can be tricky to figure out if it's causal or not. For the most part, these are not things that ever show up in real life. They're just little puzzles that professors make up. So let's just look at a couple of examples. So if I have an example of y of t is equal to x of t squared, is this a system that's going to show up in real life? No, but it's kind of fun to analyze. So let's try some values. Okay, so if I say, what is y of minus 3? Okay, so I'll take minus 3, plug it in here, y of 9. Okay, that looks into the future. That's bad. Or if I have y of 3, you know, if I plug this in, okay, that's also looking at 9. That's also bad. So both of these things look into the future, right? Because 9 is bigger than 3, and 9 is bigger than minus 3. All I needed was one counterexample. Again, it didn't matter what x is here. So this is not causal. So these concepts of linearity, time invariance, and causality, if you're a Georgia Tech EC student, you should have seen all of these already in EC 2026. We're just extending them. And for the most part, the examples we might have shown you in 2026 have a continuous time version that more or less keeps the same properties. So let's think back for a second to a discrete time context. I guess I'll call this example two. Suppose that I have a system where y of n is equal to x of minus n squared. So this is something that you might have seen in a class like EC 2026. Well, let's check this out. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to draw an axis. And I'm not going to draw an x or an y or y versus n or anything like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a specialized chart that's specifically about plotting these time index calculations. So along the x-axis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw n going this direction. And then vertically, I'm also going to plot n. What I'm going to do vertically here is I'm going to plot this first n that you see on the left. So this is just, I'm plotting n, no big deal here. For this discrete time system to be causal, I need all of my various references to time and whatever terms or factors I might have in here. Anytime I'm referring to the input, referring to the input at a particular time, that needs to lie below this inline. And it's not really a line, I guess it's a set of points. But let's try a few examples here. So what is y of zero? Well, that's just x of zero. What is y of one? Well, that's x of minus one. Okay, so that's fine. I'm gonna plot minus one here like this. What is y of two? Well, that's gonna be x of minus four. So that will go down here. And if I had space, I could put y of three is minus nine down here somewhere. This isn't to scale very well, but you get the idea. Well, what about y of minus 1? Okay, well, if I plug in minus 1, minus 1 squared is 1, but there's a minus sign here. So this will still be x of minus 1. And y of minus 2 has the same sort of thing. I'll get x of minus 4. So when I plot these things out, I'll see that my yellow dots here, all the places I'm referencing, do lie below the set of dots made by minus n squared. So the modification I made from the previous example was putting this minus sign here so that we don't have things that are looking to the future. Regardless of whether n is positive or negative, n squared is going to be a positive number. So when I put the minus sign here, I'll get a negative number. And then the squaring operation means it's always going to drive it down further. Okay, so this one's always look into the past. Many moons ago, there was this class I mentioned in the first lecture called EC 2025. It was a much more ambitious class than 2026. Basically, it didn't have the DTFT and DFT, but it had the rest of the 2026 material, plus basically all of the material we're doing now in 3084, up to, but not including Laplace transforms. Although here in 3084, we teach it at a slightly more sophisticated level than we did in 2025, since you're juniors instead of sophomores. So in this 2025 class, we would redo the discrete time material 
in the continuous time context, much like we're doing here. And I would pull out this example again. So what I would do is I would say, oh, well, let's look at an example where y of t is equal to x of minus t squared. And I would say, oh, look at this. Everything still applies. So I would erroneously say that this was causal. Notice I'm using the bad color here of red to indicate that this is not actually the case. So I used this example for years, and class after class, semester after semester, I would use this same example. And then one day in class, a student raised their hand and said, Dr. Lannerman, what about minus one to zero? And I said, what about minus one to zero? And then I went, oh, so check this out. If we put in real numbers here instead of integers and plot that out, this mostly seems to work. So I have a little section here like this, but now I have a little section here like this. And if I actually try to connect the dots through here, we see that there's this little point in here that's fairly problematic between minus one and one. Uh, first off, let me put some non-integers in here for t and see how that goes. So what is y of a half? So that's going to look up x at minus a fourth. What about y of a third? Okay, well, that's going to give me x of minus a ninth. In any case, I'm looking into the past. But what about y of minus a half or y of minus a third? So here, I'll wind up with minus... Here I'll wind up with minus, but when I plug this in and I square it, okay, here I'll get a fourth, and here I'll get a ninth. Ooh, now this is a problem. Minus a fourth is greater than minus a half, and minus a ninth is greater than minus a third. In these cases, we need to look into the future, and that's that little spot here where you see this purple arc here rising above the red line here, now that we've actually changed this into a T. So this little section here is a problem. And it comes from the fact that you usually think of squaring a number as making it bigger, but there is that little less than one spot where squaring a number actually makes it smaller. And so I didn't realize that this breaks this example in continuous time until a student pointed it out during a 2025 lecture. So now I mention this example every time I teach 3084 because it's a example that I messed up the explanation of for years. So if you are a student out there who many, many, many years ago took 2025 with me, sorry if I explained this wrong. And again, it doesn't make sense to say it's causal for everything except this region. If there's one point where you do have to look into the past, that's going to mess up the causality entirely. You just say, this system is not causal. How often will you actually encounter such a question in real life? Uh, the answer is basically never. <laughs> you know, Somebody will rarely design a system like this. There are no things in nature that will give something like this to you. But they do make fun little puzzles. So if you're not taking EC3084 with me in the summer 2020 semester, you can check out now. If you are taking EC3084 with me in the summer 2020 semester, there is a lecture eight quiz that I want you to go into Canvas and take. Now, there is something called a lockdown browser that some classes will make you install in order to make sure that you don't look up other stuff on websites or you don't have a chat window open up that you're chatting with somebody with who's helping you with the questions. There's a video you can watch on YouTube that explains how to use it. And I watched that video and it kind of made me a little sick to my stomach to watch. And when I started looking into what the lockdown browser actually is and what it does, I don't think any university should be asking you to install something like this that takes that much control over your machine, that forces you to give it that many privileges. And maybe if there's an open source version of it that we could audit and look at this underlying security questions within it, it might be marginally less horrible. And perhaps if we were giving students computers, if we were giving them laptops with this already installed on it that they could just use for a class, 
so they are not risking the other files on their machine to this, I think, fairly sinister piece of software. Maybe it might be different. But all those technical issues beside, this just feels like a setup for an episode of Black Mirror. And then when I looked at the various things like Respondus that make you set up a webcam that watch you while you take the quiz, this just looks like a horrible invasion of privacy to me. This feels terribly dystopian. Anyway, I'm not going to make you use any of this. You'll find all sorts of things online about how to defeat these various things. And I just think it would be a good idea to get out of the arms race. In a professional context, there's rarely a case where you cannot refer to reference materials. Now, there's a lot of cases where you do want to have facts at your fingertips. You shouldn't have to look up Ohm's Law every time you need Ohm's Law, because that's the point where you can start using Ohm's Law creatively. If you have to look up Ohm's Law all the time, then that's going to slow you down, and it destroys the creative vibe. When an artist is working on a painting and they run out of orange paint, they don't say, oh, well, maybe I heard sometime if you mix some colors, you get orange, and maybe if I mix red and blue, would I get orange? No, they just know you mix red and yellow, you get orange. And certainly you want your surgeon to have memorized where the various organs in your body are. But hopefully by the point they're doing surgery on you, they have had a lot of experience with bodies and organs already. So they have that internalized. Making you memorize things isn't terribly useful. So here's the rules on the quizzes. I'll open up the quiz. You go take the quiz. You can go rewatch any of my videos. You can go watch anyone's videos. You can go look at the textbook that I post on Canvas. You can go look at any other textbook you have. You can go look at any other textbook you can find online. You can Google all you want. You can find any websites you want. The one thing I would like you to not do is do not go out and chat with another human. If you can type a question into Google and the answer shows up on a web forum, whatever, that's fine. Just don't go to a forum and then ask the question on the quiz. Physics ran into a problem last semester where apparently a bunch of students were posting questions from a physics exam to Chegg, and don't do that. This is bad. Georgia Tech Legal got involved, and you don't want lawyers involved. That This is just a bad thing. So let's just not go there. So don't talk to people. I mean, I'm not anti-people in general. People are great. But for this purpose, don't talk to them. But whatever you want to look up, whatever notes you have, that's fine. If you have any concerns or questions about this, you can send me a message on Canvas or you can pop me an email.